Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a man inquiring about joining a wildlife conservation society. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six on page two. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Wildlife Conservation Society, good afternoon. Can I help you? Oh, hello. Uh, yes, I'd like to join, please. Oh, yes, certainly. I'll just get some details from you. Could I have your name? Michael Jones. Right. And can I ask where you heard about us? Was it in an advert, or did a friend tell you, or... Neither, actually. It was a radio program. Then I just got your number from the phone book. Oh, right. Uh, now I need some membership details. It's Michael Jones, and the address? 21 Beale Street. OK. Leeds. Fine. And do you know your postcode? Yes, it's uh, LS14... 2JW. OK. And do you have a daytime telephone number we can contact you on? Yes, you can call me at work. The number is 011-73586-42. And I can give you my office email address if you like. That'd probably be useful. Yes, please. It's mj at hennings.co.uk. Is that H-E-N-N-I-N-G-S? That's right. Thank you. Now, I just need to ask you some questions about exactly what you want. First of all, how long do you want the membership for? We do two, three and five year memberships, and we also do one for life. Uh, I think I'll just get the minimum length this time around. Fine. And then the type of membership. We do single, joint or family, which covers up to four children. Well, we haven't got any children, but I think I'll get the joint one because my wife will probably want to do the activities with me. Yes, fine. Let me see. That'll be £49 altogether then, please. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10 on page 2. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. How would you like to pay? Uh, by direct debit? No problem. I just need your bank details. Can you give me the name first? It's the Union Bank. And now I've got your name, but I need your account number. Ah, uh, uh, 01059612. OK. When would you like to start payment? Next month, on the 1st of October, or...? Can you make it the 15th instead? No problem. The membership will begin then, too. Is that all right? That's fine. I'll just give you a reference number in case there's any problem. Have you got a pen? Uh, yes. It's JYZ37. And we'll be sending you an information pack within a few days. Is there anything else? Uh, oh, yes. Could you send me an additional one? I've got a friend who's very interested. Certainly, no problem. 
I'll make a note of that. There's also a video we can send you if you like. There's no charge. Yes, please. That'll be great. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a holiday company representative talking to a group of tourists in a large hotel about things they can do during their holiday. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello everyone. I'm Jake Stevens and I'm your rep here at the hotel. I'm sure you'll all have a great time here. So, let me tell you a bit about what's on offer. I'll start by telling you about some of the excursions that are available for guests. One thing you have to do while you're here is go dolphin watching. On our boat trips, we pretty well guarantee you'll see dolphins. If you don't, you can repeat the trip free of charge. We organise daily trips for just 35 euros. Unfortunately, there aren't any places left for this afternoon's trip, but come and see me to book for later in the week. If you're energetic, I'd recommend our forest walk. It's a guided walk of about seven kilometres. There'll be a stop halfway, and you'll be provided with a drink and sandwiches. There's some fairly steep climbs up the hills, so you need to be reasonably fit for this one, with good shoes, oh, and bring a waterproof in case it rains. It's just 25 euros, all inclusive, and it's every Wednesday. Then on Thursdays, we organise a cycle trip, which will give you all the fun of biking without the effort. We'll take you and your bike up to the top of Mount Lana and leave you to bike back. It's a 700 metre drop in just 20 kilometres, so this isn't really for inexperienced cyclists, as you'll be going pretty fast. And if it's a clear day, you'll have fantastic views. On our local craft tour, you can find out about the traditional activities in the island. And the best thing about this trip is that it's completely free. You'll be taken to a factory where jewellery is made, and also a ceramics centre. If you want, you can buy some of the products, but that's entirely up to you. The trip starts after lunch on Thursday, and you'll return by 6pm. If you're interested in astronomy, you may already know that the island's one of the best places in the world to observe the night sky. We can offer trips to the observatory on Friday for those who are interested. They cost 90 euros per person, 
and you'll be shown the huge telescopes and have a talk from an expert who will explain all about how they work. Afterwards, we'll head down to Sunset Beach, where you can have a dip in the ocean if you want, before we head off back to the hotel. Finally, there's horse riding. This is organised by the Equestrian Centre over near Playa Cortino, and it's a great experience if you're a keen horseback rider, or even if you've never been on a horse before. They take you down to the beach, and you can canter along the sand and through the waves. It costs 35 euros, and it's available every day. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So, there's plenty to do in the daytime, but what about nightlife? Well, the number one attraction's called Musical Favourites. Guests enjoy a three-course meal and unlimited free drinks, and watch a fantastic show, starting with musicals set in Paris, and then crossing the Atlantic to Las Vegas, and finally Copacabana. At the end, the cast members come down from the stage, still in their stunning costumes, and you'll have a chance to chat with them. It's hugely popular, so let me know now if you're interested, because it's no good leaving it until the last minute. It's on Friday night. Tickets are just 50 euros each, but for an extra 10 euros, you can have a table right by the stage. If you'd like to go back in time, there's the Castle Feast on Saturday evening. It's held in a 12th century castle, and you eat in the great courtyard, with ladies in long gowns serving your food. You're given a whole chicken each, which you eat in the medieval way, using your hands instead of cutlery. And you're entertained by competitions where the horseback riders attempt to knock one another off their horses. Then you can watch the dancers in the ballroom and join in as well if you want. OK, so now if anyone has... That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear a student called Rob, who is in the first year of a theatre studies course, talking to another student called Mia, who's in the fourth year of the same course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi Rob, how's the course going? Oh, hi Mia. Yeah, great. I can't believe the first term's nearly over. <laughs> I saw your group's performance last night at the student theatre. It was good. Really? Yeah, but now we have to write a report on the whole thing, an in-depth analysis. I don't know where to start. 
Like I have to write about the role I played, the Doctor, how I developed the character. Well, what was your starting point? Uh, my grandfather was a Doctor before he retired, and I just based it on him. OK, but how? Uh, did you talk to him about it? He must have all sorts of stories, but he never says much about his work, even now. He has a sort of authority, though. Mm. So how did you manage to capture that? I'd... I'd visualise what he must have been like in the past when he was sitting in his consulting room listening to his patients. OK, so that's what you explain in your report. Right. Then there's the issue of atmosphere. So in the first scene, we needed to know how boring life was in the doctor's village in the 1950s. So when the curtain went up on the first scene in the waiting room, there was that long silence before anyone spoke. And then people kept saying the same thing over and over, like, cold, isn't it? Yes, and everyone wore grey and brown and just sat in a row. Yes, all those details of the production. Mm. And I have to analyse how I functioned in the group, what I found out about myself. I know I was so frustrated at times when we couldn't agree. Mm, yes. So did one person emerge as the leader? Sophia did. That was OK. She helped us work out exactly what to do for the production. And that made me feel better, I suppose. When you understood what needed doing? Yes. And Sophia did some research, too. That was useful in developing our approach. Like what? Well, she found these articles from the 1950s about how relationships between children and their parents, or between the public and people like bank managers or the police, were shifting. Interesting. And did you have any practical problems to overcome? Well, in the final rehearsal, everything was going fine until the last scene. That's where the doctor's first patient appears on stage on his own. The one in the wheelchair? Yes, and he had this really long speech, with the stage all dark except for one spotlight. Mm. And then that stuck somehow, so it was shining on the wrong side of the stage. But anyway, we got that fixed, thank goodness. Yes, it was fine on the night. Before you hear the rest of the discussion... You have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Based on Crackles with Rob's website. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. But while you're here, Mia, I wanted to ask you about the year abroad option. Would you recommend doing that? Yes, definitely. It's a fantastic chance to study in another country for a year. I think I'd like to do it, but it looks very competitive. There's only a limited number of places. Yes. So, next year, when you're in the second year of the course, you need to work really hard in all your theatre studies modules. Only students with good marks get places. You have to prove that you know your subject really well. Right. So, how did you choose where to go? Well, I decided I wanted a programme that would fit in with what I wanted to do after I graduate. So, I looked for a university with emphasis on acting rather than directing, for example. It depends on you. Then, about six months before you go, you have to email the scheme coordinator with your top three choices. I had a friend who missed the deadline and didn't get her first choice. So, you do need to get a move on at that stage. You'll find that certain places are very popular with everyone. And don't you have to write a personal statement at that stage? Yes. Right. I'll get some of the final year students to give me some tips. Maybe see if I can read what they wrote. I think that's a very good idea. Hmm. I don't mind showing you what I did. And while you're abroad, don't make the mistake I made. I got so involved I forgot all about making arrangements for when I came back here for the final year. Make sure you stay in touch so they know your choices for the optional modules. You don't want to miss out doing your preferred specialisms. Right. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three.
Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture about noise in cities. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. This lecture will be about the science of acoustics, the study of sound, in relation to urban environments such as cities. As an acoustic engineer myself, I think this is an area where we're likely to see great changes. In the past, researching urban soundscapes was simple. We measured levels of sound in decibels, so I used to take my sound meter and I measured the noise somewhere, and then I might ask a sample of people to say at what level the sound became annoying. With data like this, acoustic engineers have been able to build up what we call noise maps, maps of the sound environment. But actually, these aren't a lot of use. What they do show is that the highest noise levels are generally on roads. Well, that's not really very surprising. But there's quite a lot going on that these maps don't show, because they can't capture the complex way that sound varies over time. So they ignore important issues such as the noise someone might hear from the open windows or gardens of their neighbours. And this sort of noise can be quite significant in summer. We don't have any databases on this sort of information. As well as that, these records of sound levels take no account of the fact that people vary in their perceptions of noise. So someone like me with years of working in acoustics might be very different from you in that regard. But anyway, even though these noise maps are fairly crude, they've been useful in providing information and raising awareness that noise matters. We need to deal with it, and so it's a political matter. And that's important. We need rules and regulations because noise can cause all sorts of problems. Those of you who are city dwellers know that things go on 24 hours a day, so city dwellers often suffer from interrupted sleep. It's also known that noise can lead to a rise in levels of stress, due to physical changes in the body affecting the composition of the blood. And there are other problems as well. For instance, if schoolchildren don't have a quiet place to study, their work will suffer. Now, one problem with decibel measurement is that it doesn't differentiate between different types of noise. Some types of sounds that most people would probably think of as nice and relaxing might well score quite highly in decibel levels. Think of the sound made by a fountain in a town square, for example. That's not necessarily something that we'd want to control or reduce. So maybe researchers should consider these sorts of sounds in urban design. This is going to be tricky, because just measuring decibel levels isn't going to help us here. Instead, many researchers are using social science techniques, studying people's emotional response to sound, by using questionnaires and so on. So what exactly do people want to hear in an urban environment? Some recent interdisciplinary research has come out with results that at first sight seem contradictory. A city needs to have a sense of activity, so it needs to be lively, with sounds like the clack of high heels on a pavement or the hiss of a coffee machine. 
But these mustn't be too intrusive, because at the same time, we need to be able to relax. One of the major problems in achieving this will be getting architects and town planners to use the research. Apart from studying the basics of acoustics, these people receive very little training in this area. But in fact, they should be regarding sound as an opportunity to add to the experience of urban living, whereas at present, they tend to see it as something to be avoided or reduced as far as possible, or something that's just a job for engineers, like the street drainage system. What's needed is for noise in cities to be regarded as an aesthetic quality, as something that has the qualities of an art form. If we acknowledge this, then we urgently need to know what governs it and how designers can work with it. We need to develop a complex understanding of many factors. What is the relationship between sound and culture? What can we learn from disciplines such as psychology about the way that sound interacts with human development and social relationships, and the way that sound affects our thoughts and feelings? Can we learn anything from physics about the nature of sound itself? Today's powerful technologies can also help us. To show us their ideas and help us to imagine the effect their buildings will have, architects and town planners already use virtual reality. But these programmes are silent. In the future, such programmes could use realistic sounds, meaning that soundscapes could be explored before being built. So hopefully, using the best technology we can lay our hands on, the city of the future will be a pleasure to the ears as well as the eyes. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. IELTS IDP Listening Tips and Tricks Diversify your listening exposure, acclimatize yourself to a range of accents by actively listening to podcasts, news broadcasts, and documentaries from various English-speaking countries. Consider resources like the BBC World Service or regional radio stations. Develop focused concentration. Maintaining focused attention for extended periods is paramount. Practice active listening with full-length IELTS practice tests under timed conditions. Test taking strategies. Prioritize comprehension, not verbatim recall. The test plays the recording only once. Focus on capturing the answers to the questions rather than every single detail. Pre-scan the questions. Briefly review the questions before each recording to understand the specific information you need to identify. Maintain focus and move forward. If you miss an answer, don't dwell on it. Move on to the next question to avoid losing focus on the present information. Recognize paraphrasing. Answers may not match the spoken words exactly. Be attentive to synonyms and rephrased ideas. Stay alert for answer pacing. Answers may be delivered quickly or with pauses in between. Remain alert and prepared to write throughout the recording. Additional considerations. Think in English. Avoid mentally translating the spoken content. This can hinder your ability to process information and retain key details. Verify before writing. Briefly double-check that the information you hear aligns with the question before filling in the answer. Utilize review time. During the 30-second breaks after each section, review your answers for spelling and clarity. Transfer answers meticulously. Once all recordings are finished, dedicate the 10-minute transfer window to carefully copy your answers from the test booklet to the answer sheet. By consistently practicing these strategies and actively building your listening skills, you can significantly enhance your chances of achieving a strong score on the IELTS listening test.